Good morning. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of James, chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith, when you, that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. As most of you are aware, we are in the midst of a year-long search for the next president of SIBI. And over this past year, uh, many people have been presented to the uh, search committee as possible uh, next presidents. And from all of the people that have been uh, turned in, uh, we are now at a place where there are three candidates that are seriously being considered for this role. And yesterday morning, we heard from Tad Masteller, and our guest speaker this morning is Chris Swinford. Uh, Chris is, I think, pretty well known to most all of us here, uh, but I certainly count it a privilege to be able to uh, introduce him this morning. But before I say anything further, about Chris, I would like to introduce uh, his family to you. First of all, I would ask that his wife of 31 years, Brenda, please stand up and let's welcome her. <laughs> Chris and Brenda have two sons. Their eldest is Alan Swinford. Alan is uh, married to Haley, and they have two sons. Gavin and Kieran, and uh, I see Alan and Gavin here this morning. Uh, would you please stand up? <laughs> Thank you. I don't know if, ah, okay. Is Haley here? There she is. Haley, please stand up. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We are so pleased that you're able to be with us this morning. Um, they really are a delightful family. As I mentioned, uh, Chris and Brenda have a second son whose name is Daniel, and Daniel works at Eastern New Mexico University in Portales, New Mexico. Um, Chris has preached in several congregations in this area of Texas as well as into New Mexico uh, for a number of years. He is a 1989 graduate of Sunset and uh, after working for a number of years in local work, he and his family moved over to Ukraine in, uh, and that is where I first met Chris in the year 2000. Uh, Chris served as a teacher at the Ukrainian Bible Institute in Donetsk and and served as the Dean of Students while he was there. He was active not only in teaching, but also in church planting, in church development, and in every facet of strengthening the church uh, in that nation. Uh, Chris and, and Brenda have a deep love for uh, that country. And in a sense, it was kind of natural that we would gravitate toward one another because they had two children and we had two children uh, of pretty much the same age, and uh, that began for us what I consider to be a, to myself, a very valuable friendship. And Chris, over the years, has proven himself, first of all, I think, to be someone who takes seriously the Word of God. Uh, in his personal studies, in his uh, placing of God's Word in his memory, he is one who believes in continuing education. Uh, because he has gone on and uh, acquired a great many degrees, but when you go into his office, you will not see those degrees on the wall. Rather, what you will see are the photos of the, of the people that his life and his work has impacted, uh, because they are truly his epistle. And uh, he has worked very diligently over the years to continue to be involved in missions. Chris came here and returned to Sunset in 2005, which was 12 years ago. 
as the Assistant Dean of the International Studies Division, and then became the Dean of International Studies in 2006, and then moved on to become the Vice President of Advancement in 2010. In 2010, I, I became the Dean of International Studies, and, and I would relate to you that Chris established a wonderful platform upon which I have been privileged to work. And the things which he did in that ministry uh, have impacted a lot of lives. Uh, I've never had to clean up anything after him, and everything that he does is in good hands. Uh, for those of, of you who may not know, Chris teaches evangelism and AIM and church planting in the missions track and in the missions program. Uh, Chris, uh, in case you may not have known, is a Cowboys fan mm -hmm. and a Rangers fan, mm -hmm. and certainly uh, in his younger days and, and perhaps now still is, uh, is a person who really is interested in athletics, football and, and baseball when he was younger, and even some golf, and you may not be aware that he uh, once scored two holes in one in a row. Uh, physics has yet to explain how <laughs> it went through the windmill as it was turning uh -huh. and bounced off of the shark uh, okay. and went into the hole, but right. uh, Chris is skillful in everything that he does. And uh, Chris is just a person who is beloved here at Sunset uh, for his communication skills, for his personality, his love for people, but most importantly, for his love, for his God, and for his dedication to his word. And so I would invite you to welcome Chris up here in the way that we usually do. Chris, come preach the word. Thanks for most of that. <laughs> if your closest friends can't gouge you a little, I guess you're, uh, you're in trouble. Now, I appreciate that. I was, thought, I was thinking where he was going with all the talk about sports and all of that was my athletic physique, but he turned a corner and <laughs> went a different way. The flag room. 30 years ago, this year, I walked into this room for the first time. I sat among the flags. I sat by my friends. I sat a court by my guys who would become lifelong friends, though we barely knew each other in that moment, we were the new class at Sunset. And it was awesome. They told us about these flags, and they talked about all those from Sunset who had gone to all these countries. And Truman Scott, who was the dean of the school at the time, said, look around and see if one calls out to you. I stared at all of them, and I kept waiting for one of them to say, Hey, Chris, come over here. Uh, they didn't say anything. But later, one on this side, most of the way down, a blue and yellow flag would call out to several of us. And I would get to see sunset on another continent. And that was awesome when we came to chapel together. But I think back to that first time. Something that was said that day touched me so deeply that I wrote it down in my Bible and I was looking through the other day at the things that I wrote in there during my time at Sunset as a student. And I thought, it's where it's all got to begin. Because for us, this isn't the flag room. It's home. It's the place we fall back to. It's the place where we walk in and we find acceptance and all those things, even when the rest of the world maybe doesn't seem to accept us the way they really could. We watch TV and we get scared at what the world's got, but then we fall back home. We sit here among the flags, in front of a pulpit that hosted so many incredible, godly gospel preachers, sitting in chairs with others who had great hopes and dreams and went out to do great works of ministry. We came home. And we sit here, still confronted by the nations, but still comforted by the presence of the assembly here. Years ago, Klein Payton gave our first chapel. He was the first president of Sunset. He was the founder. And he was an extraordinary man, for those of you not old enough to know him. And he was powerful. 
and a little bit intimidating. And when he stood up and said, I'm going to talk to you about being faithful unto death, we all sort of backed up in our seats a little bit. But at the end of his lesson, he had a special message for us. He said, ministry is hard. Sometimes it's more than you can bear alone. When it gets hard, come home. Let sunset minister to you. Let us strengthen and counsel you. Then you go back and you fulfill your ministry. It must have really touched me to write it down that day. And I know I didn't write it down exactly. And somewhere maybe beyond the clouds, Klein's looking down and going, no, that's not exactly what I said. I said it more this way. But this was the message received by a young man barely in his 20s. This is home. Over the years, I would find times where I would get frustrated or hurt or didn't know what to do, and I would fall back to this room to sit among my teachers, to ask for their advice, their wisdom, just as so many have and just as so many of you will do. We're going to talk about ministry. Well, that's too big a topic. I don't want to talk about everything I was blessed to do in ministry or something because That really doesn't help you. I want to talk more about what it is. There are several different definitions in the Greek. I'd be happy to talk about all of them. We don't have time for that. So we'll just look at one. Huperitus. This is a word that means under rower. And it was a very special thing back at that time. When they were rowing a ship and a giant storm would come and begin to push it against it and push against the rocks, they would cry out, it's time for Huperitus. It's time for the under rowers. And they would come running out and go to a section of the boat and they would grab an oar. And with everything they had, they would pull and tug against the waves. They weren't the professional type rowers. These were people that did other things in life. But in times of storm, they would run up to make a difference. They would grab an oar. They would pull. They would push. They would do whatever they had to do keep everyone on that boat safe. In this life, we need ministry. We need people that minister to us. We need under rowers. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's frustrating. Sometimes it it scares us a little. And during those times, we look around for those who will row up next to us. That's why I love Tim so much. I know that in the midst of my storm, I will hear wood slapping water. And Tim will come by in his boat. And he will jump in mine and together we'll be able to row. So I love my wife and my family so much is because we row together. And that's an important part of ministry. We shouldn't be surprised when we need help rowing our boat. The Bible made it clear we were going to need help from time to time. Jesus said in John 16, verse 33, in this world you will have tribulation. If you read that in the Greek, it says, in this world you will have tribulation. (laughs) Don't argue with the text, agree with the text. Maybe you're thinking, well, I don't have a lot of tribulation. Tribulation is literally pressures placed upon you. Maybe I don't have a lot of those pressures. Well, hang on, pressure's coming. It's a promise from the Messiah. In this world we'll have them. James said in James 1 verse 2 that we will all encounter various trials. That word various literally means multicolored. You may face a green one today and a blue one tomorrow, but they're all trials and they're all trouble. And you may find yourself with needing someone to row beside you. Acts 14 verse 22, Paul says, After a really bad day, being left for dead in a field, it is through many tribulations that we must enter the kingdom. When people come into Christ, we celebrate their birth. We ought to apologize for what's going to happen next. Because life will not be that easy, will it? They'll need ministry. Paul told Timothy, a young preacher, 2 Timothy 3.12, All who desire to live godly lives in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. All of us. He told Timothy, don't feel like you're special when you're persecuted. And when you're not persecuted, don't feel like it's going to continue that way. This is what we all have in common. 
And my favorite is 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Peter, an elder in the Lord's church, an apostle said, Do not be surprised at the fiery trials that come upon you as if something strange were happening to you. And that's exactly what we do. Something bad happens, we go, Wow, I can't believe it happened. This was totally unexpected. And we ought to be saying, Here he is again. Satan's still playing the game, isn't he? Bad things are continuing to happen. Once again, we need ministry. Things happen in life that remind us that there are storms. The other day, several of us were waiting for a helicopter to land at a hospital, and we remember there are storms. It reminds us all over again that these things happen. We have faced several great deaths the last few years here at Sunset, and they remind us that there are storms. We are called to ministry. We are not called to be social commentators. We are not called upon to be just mere spokesmen, though being a spokesman is the greatest of jobs, I believe. We are called upon to get our hands dirty, to get splinters in our fingers as we row with reckless abandon in the lives of others as they go through storms of that nature. But sometimes maybe it's us going in the storm. Klein told us that day, don't be surprised at what's going to happen. The churches you work for won't always be friendly. And we all went, what? What's, what's that about? Sometimes elders won't like you much. And we said, but they're supposed to be on our side. Sometimes the members won't appreciate everything you do. We were completely dumbfounded. We'd been sold a bad bill of goods. We were told, come here, sit in the chairs, learn the stuff, have a blessed life. And you will with sporadic storms spread throughout. And sometimes even in ministry, we need an under rower. These moments, though, can be our best. What seems like the worst for us can be the best for us. James says, For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. The problem with these storms is they also show our frailties. They show the tendencies that we keep hidden. They show the lives that we wish no one else ever saw. That makes it horrible for us. But it's all part of that plan to perfect us, to have us become who we're called to be. Sometimes we need help to make it through. In the end, needing that help is not our weakness. It's the strength of community, the strength of ministry. And it's ultimately what makes us most strong. In 1990, there was a movie come out that really impacted my life, and it's called City Slickers. It didn't really impact my life that much. Most of the movies I like are from way back there because that's back when I had time to watch movies. Uh, don't know as many about today. But Billy Crystal was in this movie, City Slickers, and all of us that grew up in the country, all of us from farming and ranching backgrounds were going, finally, put some city folks on a horse and let's see what happens. But there was one part of the story that really touched me. There were three friends. It was Mitch's birthday, and they gave him a special trip. They went out to this dude ranch so they could live like men and all those kind of things. They found out real quick that it really is painful to live life that way. But as they're going along, they have all this time to talk. And once they're going along, three of them astride on a horse, and they're talking about what their best day and their worst day was. Billy Crystal talks about going out and seeing Yankee Stadium and the, the grass before him and all that with his dad before he died and all that. And his worst day being when his wife was said she might have breast cancer. And he, they were talking about all these things that guys only talk about when we get away from everything else. Mitch and Phil told their stories, laid their souls bare, and then they looked over at Ed and said, okay, Ed, it's your turn. And he said, no, I don't play games. I don't want to do this. I don't want to talk about this. And they said, why? Come on, man. Okay, if the worst day is the hardest day, tell us your best day. And he said, I was nine years old. Dad had been out drinking again. He came home and he was yelling and screaming at my mom and he raised up his hand to hit her one more time 
And I jumped in between them and looked at him and said, No, you're not going to do this anymore. You're not going to hurt my mom. I'm not going to let you. I'm big now and I'll stop you. And he said, My dad stared at me and turned and walked out of the house and never came back. That was my best day. They were riding along and finally Phil said, well, what was your worst day? And he said, same day. My worst day happened a couple of years ago. You go to the doctor thinking you have the flu. You end up laying in an ICU bed. I can still tell you about how many tiles are on the ceiling, how many electrical plugs are on the walls. I can still tell you what the, all the different machines are and what they sound like. Because you lay there and you deal with the worst. You deal with pain. I still feel the, them tearing at my flesh to get the infection out. I still feel all those things. I remember them talking about sepsis and what that is, uh, blood poisoning, being toxic. I still remember all of them wearing little masks and gloves, gathering around the bed. I still remember all those things, maybe too vividly. It was the worst. I remember looking over at my wife. You don't want to see your loved one suffer just because you're in a storm. But she rode hard. I remember my friends coming from here, sitting in the room, not knowing what to do, but the splinters in their hands were obvious as they came to row through it with me. I remember the long hours. Daylight and dark mean nothing in ICU. And as days stretched on and on, and as they continued to walk in and out, and new nurses would come in, new nurses would leave, you would wonder how many days had gone by, how many hours had passed. Then you're left alone with a really dangerous thing. You're left alone with yourself. I found out something horrible about myself on my worst day. I looked in the eyes of the doctors and heard the things they were saying. Then it occurred to me, this is it. There will be no coming back from this one. The doctors didn't have much hope to give us. And I would look at them just waiting for someone to wink and smile. Let me know it's all a big joke. But it kept getting more and more desperate. And the more and more they talked, the deeper sort of hole you sort of slide into. Until I was at the point where I asked myself, am I ready to go? Am I ready for this moment? And in some ways, the answer was a definite no. I'm not ready to leave my children. Gavin was seven months old. He wasn't going to remember my touch, my voice anything. And I was scared of letting go for that. I never want to leave my wife. I want us to die in the same instant, a long time from now. But I want to be with her forever, and I know in Christ we will be. But in that moment, my mind told me it's okay to go, and my heart screamed, stop. You're not ready. There are sins you haven't dealt with yet. There are issues you haven't faced. You can't go stand before the sovereign God of the universe, no matter how many years you preached, no matter how many mission fields you walked on, you can't stand before him and go, I'm sort of sure. I'm mostly thinking I go to heaven. I know intellectually, Gerald Payton taught me First John. I knew that part. I knew that I could know of my salvation. Ed told me that 50 million times when we were going through school. We can know, and I knew, but inside my heart, I didn't know. And I don't ever want you to be in that position. A few days later, the doctors changed their expressions. They sort of had a smile on their face. 
They came by later to tell me the bad news all over again, which is really great. Tim was there for one of those times, sitting in a chair, and I kept looking at him going, well, why are they telling me this stuff? This is horrible. Well, you had this sort of chance of surviving, but really it didn't look good at all. Your funeral probably should have done it on this day, and I'd be looking at him going, stop it. I don't want to think about this anymore. But I left that hospital going, now's the time. Your worst day can be your best day. If there's any day in life I'm grateful for, it was the day when I realized how bad everything was. I had some folks in here that were pulling on oars. My family splashing in the water. But that was the day for one of the first times in my adult life where I heard Jesus pulling the oars for me. Isn't that funny that you can preach that long and minister so long and be so involved in doing your work and doing your ministry and doing all those things that you begin to lose sight of the one you work for. Needed ministry. And in the time since then, I've been blessed to be ministered to by some of the best. These are the lessons I've learned. I'm going to say them real fast. Lesson number one is I should have been more understanding and caring as an under rower when others face such moments. How many bedsides... Have we been by? Pat, how many bedsides do you think we've stood by? Amazing amount. And how many times I walked in and said, well, I've only got a few minutes. Let me say a quick prayer with you and then leave. And I know from experience, laying in that bed, you're going, wait, 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 wait. When you leave, part of God leaves with you. Could you just stay just a minute? I would have taken those moments much more seriously, knowing what I know now. We've got to value each opportunity to grab an oar. People talk about ministry like it's a burden. Pulling that oar is our freedom. It's our power, it's our joy, and it's our heart. And if you can't pull it, you don't know Jesus. Because Jesus grabs the oar. If all we ever care about is standing there when everybody looks on us adoringly listening to our message, that's not the job. That's the dessert of our job. Our job is sitting with the homeless person on the street pulling for him, taking the person whose marriage falls apart and grabbing an oar and pulling with them. I need to spend more time valuing those moments. Lesson learned number two, I need to focus more on enjoying, serving, and saving my family. Because every day in this world, my family rose for me. And I was so busy wanting to do everything else in life that sometimes I was absent during their storms. If I'm going to be there for anybody, I've got to learn this one lesson. Under rowing starts at home. If you can't row at home, you're not going to have the health necessary to row for others in their moment of need. If I'm not the husband I'm supposed to be, I'm pretty worthless in the kingdom. If I'm not the daddy to Alan I'm supposed to be, I'm worthless in the kingdom. If I'm not the grandpa to Kieran I'm supposed to be, I'm just pretty worthless. Because I don't have the strength and foundation to row from. Lesson learned number three, I'm not as indispensable as I assumed I was here at sunset. That was a little tough. We're blessed with a lot of great under rowers. My heroes in ministry are Jeff Rader, Linda Wagner, Bob Jackson, Bill Yasko, Richard Baggett, John Clinton, now Christian Thompson. Because I got out of months of being on a shelf Walked back in the office and said, okay, let's try to dig ourselves out of this. And I looked around and went, man, everything's going great. What's wrong with this picture? I found out I might be the most expendable person in advancement. Isn't it sad when you stick your, hole in the, your hand in the bucket of water, you pull it out, and there's no hole? That was my experience here at Sunset. And I got to thank God for those who under row for you when you need help. When I couldn't do my job, Jeff did my job. Bob did my job. Truett did my job. So many people from so many places said, give me the oar. And I realized my place in life is just grab an oar for someone else from time to time and do the best I can. 
Number four, I've got to genuinely and transparently deal with damaged parts of my life so I can be unafraid when I face death again. If you ever want to talk about this, I'll talk to you about it. It shouldn't take death to make you notice the fractures in your world. For me, I was so busy trying to work for God that I didn't really notice the fractures in my foundation. Guys, have people in your life that point them out to you. Have people that you trust enough to let in that way. But more than anything else, deal with things when they're small. Because dealing with them later is actually a lot harder. Finally, oh, that's if you want to be an effective underwriter, make sure you're genuinely faithful. I always wondered if I should write a letter back to the churches I preach saying, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know. But I'm glad for my best day. Lesson number five. I'm blessed to be a part of the Sunset family and will gladly underrow in whatever way is best for the ministry. I don't care what I do here. I just want to sit among the flags. I just want to be home. Isn't that the way you feel? Corey, wouldn't you come do anything? There's nothing better than being in heaven on earth, than being on the mountain. And it doesn't matter so much what we do. It matters that we're here. But that's true of any place we're at. Know that your value is not based on what you do, but on who you are and when you do it. Paul challenged Timothy to fulfill his ministry. I've been given another chance to fulfill my ministry. Now it's your turn. Here's your battle orders. This is your homework. Get yourself ready to minister. Get your calluses built up on your hands so you can pull. Get right with God and right with those you love around you. Then grab an oar.